We've now seen what gates we can use. Um, so the second video in the series was explaining the knot gate, the C knot, the Toffoli gate, and the Hadamard gate. And we're now going to see the first usage of those uh, gates to build an interesting quantum algorithm, which covers something or mentions something which we don't have classically. So here I will be using the same representation as in the last two videos. Um, again, representing n qubits at 2 to the n values, so vector of length 2 to the n with integer or complex values. And we're going to do computations on these representations. So of course, in that sense, we can do it classically, but the benefit that the computer would be, the quantum computer would be doing is that it would be a lot faster than what I can do in simulation and of course a lot shorter. So just n instead of 2 to the n. So the algorithm I'm going to look at in this video is Simon's algorithm. Now Simon's algorithm was the first interesting quantum algorithm except for it's still waiting for an application, it's still missing any real, life, any real life application which really needs this. And the point is that it takes a function which is defined over f2 to the n. So it's a vector where each component is computation small 2. Um, the image does not matter so much. So here's an example which has both of them being length 2. Um, and actually in this case the computations are mod 2 and giving 0 and 1. But we can do other functions as well. But the interesting thing is that Simon's algorithm allows you to find something like a period, but it's not a period of an integer function, but it's a period in this vector space f2 to the n. Well, let's get all the definitions in there. So there's a function from f2 to the n to something, in this case length n. We do need to be able to efficiently compute this function, where, well, this also means we have to come up with a quantum circuit for this computation, and we need to have this expressed in these reversible gates, but we know how to do that. And then this function is assumed to have a period modulo to, well, f2 to the n period. So that f of u is the same as f of u plus s for this s. And there shouldn't be any other s primes which has the same property. And then the goal of Simon's algorithm is to figure out this value of s. And now what you could be doing classically is, well, you compute f for a bunch of u's and you hope to find something where, well, you get the same value. And then the larger the output space is, the less likely that you accidentally get the same value. I mean, just it would be mapping to one bit that would be way too often. But having f2 to the n to f2 to the n, basically, then we it's sufficiently rare to get collisions. Simon's algorithm, instead of basically doing a brute force search here, takes only n operations. So brute forcing would be 2 to the n, and this one does only n computations. Now, each of those is an evaluation of f, but that we would have to do traditionally as well. This is the reversal computation, and it's a computation in quantum superposition, which means, well, we have to build our gate and then throw, f, uh, throw the inputs for f. What I'll be doing in my example is a 3 qubits to 3 qubits function. And the way I'll be writing it is that the column index is the first three qubits and the row index is the second three qubits. Now this number there is zero in every component, so that is, well, zero in any case, but if I write it as three qubits and three qubits, it's zero, zero. The next one would be, well, the row index is zero, the column index is one, etc. So if I'm doing Hardamar zero, that means I'm doing something on the row there, like on the first row, I'm doing something on the adjacent positions. And that's, well, after I've done this pure zero state, where it's very clear that if I measure this, I get zero, I start doing a bunch of Hardamars. So I do Hardamar zero, which just takes, well, zero and one, and turns those into zero plus one, uh, sorry, one zero, and turns these into 1 plus 0 and 1 minus 0. And um, I got the signs wrong, so it's 1 plus 0 and 1 minus 0. Both of them are 1. 
Again, I'm leaving out the scaling. And then that won't change anything in the other values because all of those just contains zeros. If I then do a Hadamard 1 that was doing the gap of 2, so then the 1s percolate through, so it's the 0 and the 2 and the 1 and the 3 getting this. And finally, I'm doing a Hadamard 2, which is taking the bottom half and the top half. And now the columns will be playing a role. So now I start computing the function in the second qubits, in the second part of the qubits. So I now have in the first three qubits, I have a uniform distribution. So at this point, if I would be measuring the first three qubits, everything is equally like. What I'm now going to be doing is I compute in the row indices this function. And I'm giving this function as a bunch of operations similar to what we had in the last lecture, which is just knots, C knots, and toffelies. And so those will be just flipping where the one goes. And so that means the one gets permuted, well, each column has one one and a lot of zeros, and it gets moved around somewhere. In the row indices, it will just continue to be a one every separate. So if I just measure the first three qubits, this part will not change anything, but the second three qubits, those will modify it. Okay, here we go. So step five is evaluation of f of u. And I'm starting with the C0 controlled, not on three. So all of these will be on the qubits three, four, and five, so the second half of the qubits, and controlled or doubly controlled by the first three qubits. So if the first, if the zero qubit is set, then I negate or flip the three qubit. And so that does this pattern, this alternating pattern that we see here. And then I'll do some more shuffling. So each of those steps, you can work out exactly which operation I've been doing. And then you see that, okay, it permutes where those ones are going. And so you can figure out what function f I've been computing here. Importantly, I'm only touching the second part, the last three qubits, meaning the one moves around in each column. So that's what I mean by is its own universe. And so at this point, that is the end of the computation. So now the um, each u position, so the first part is u, and then the other part contains f of u. So this was just one operation of f, well, on all of the n qubits. And now I will be doing some more interesting operations, namely, I'll be doing some Hadamard operations. And those we know will change the values. So this will now change the distribution also on the first qubits. Okay, oh, also, you can already see, I mean, it's a small example, so I can't hide too much in there. And you see a symmetry um, that if you look at, uh, if I flip the, uh, in the U part, in the first part, if I flip the first and the th second uh, zeros of the two qubit, then I'm getting the same values. So that's what you see with the gaps here. And of course, Simon's algorithm now wants us to find this 101 pattern. How do we go about this? So now I'll be doing the Hadamard that I just mentioned. So um, now I will be seeing negative numbers. I don't want to destroy the nice column structure here, so I put a bar on top. And so now we're also no longer computing mod 2 anywhere. So before the gates were naturally computing mod 2, now the Hadamard is again taking these values as integer values. And Hadamard 1, Hadamard 2, and that's already it. So at this point I stop. So I have done three more Hadamars after the computation of the function. I've done three Hadamars to get into the uniform distribution on the first three qubits, then the function, and now three more Hadamars, and then I stop. Now I have a measure. If I measure just the first three qubits, that means I'm measuring the column indices, and okay, I will only measure the columns which have non-zero values. Each column has the same weight. Each of those has four entries equal to two, and so, or, or minus two. So going by the amplitudes, the column index um, will be one of those 
all of those with equal probability. So we'll either measure zero, meaning the zeros column there. We won't measure one, we might measure two. Not three, not four, we might measure five. And we might measure seven. Now think of the binary representation of those. So this is either the all zero vector, so zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, or one, one, one. And so each of those has the property that it's perpendicular, so orthogonal to 101, meaning if you do the dot product of these with 101, you're getting zero. Well, that's trivially the case for zero. Now with 010, it has the ones and the zeros match. If you multiply 5 by 5, you're getting zero, taking the 101 as 5 in this case. So 101 times 101 gives zero, and then also the 7, so 111 times 101 gives zero. So we have now gotten one of those vectors. But there are lots of things that zero is orthogonal to. So zero doesn't tell us anything. The two, yeah, okay, it pins it down, means that, okay, well, the, the middle bit is not set. The seven pins down that it's an, um, an even parity. And together, if we also would know the five, but well, we won't know the five, we also learn basically one bit. And that's why we have to do n measurements. So we have to repeat this a few times to really pin down that it was the one zero one. And we might have a longer streak of being unlucky if we measure the zero too often. Um, or we're getting the two again after we get the two once before. But as soon as we're getting multiple entries here, we can quickly figure out that this was that S is one zero one. So that's what Simons is doing. And as I said, well, it's it's an interesting algorithm. It is exponentially faster than what we have before. So traditionally, you'll be doing two to the n computation roughly to figure out what s is. And now we're just doing n computations. But we don't really have any interesting function where this periodicity means anything. Um, in symmetric photography, we have lots of functions which are module two. But in symmetric photography, these functions normally depend on a key. And you don't have that key if you're trying to break it. So having a function which you can actually operate on in superposition um, and having this, this binary nature, that is still asking for an application. But you can generalize it. So you can generalize it to having a different number of output bits from input bits. Um, as long as there is some S, which, well, binary addition gives some periodicity. And normally the algorithm figures out as, as I said, you can be unlucky for a sequence, but normally it should be getting it. The very interesting generalization by Shor, so Simon came first and then Shor saw this and noticed how he can change this addition of vectors mod 2 with a more general operation. And we have seen already in the RSA versus Shor that, well, this is very interesting. I don't go into the details of Shor because it's harder to explain than Simon. Um, but if you want to dig into this, you'll actually notice that it's not an arbitrary addition, it's still an addition model 2 to the n, but that's good enough to get the normal periodicities by choosing the 2 to the powers. Well, that's not the same n necessarily. So coming up with a large power of n, which is, say, larger than a group order or larger than the phi of the uh, RSA function. So yeah, so sure, finding such a period, um, here we can see that if it takes a want to know what is the order of two modulo n, where n is an RSA number, so we don't have the factorization of n. And then we have seen in the video how we can use the knowledge of s to factor n. And so Shor gives us this s as an integer, whereas Simon would know this only as a binary vector. But the algorithms have a very similar nature, just Shor has some extra error. And also as a solution for the exercise sheet, the first one, so stop here, spoiler alert, if you haven't solved that exercise yet, um, to solve discrete logs with Shor, well, you want to turn it also into something like a period finding on two arguments. So you have your discrete log problem with G and H, and you want to figure out what is the discrete log of, G, uh, of H to the base G. And so you can set up a function which is taking G to the U, H to the V, and then ask, hey, when are these 
values the same for different use EVs. And so periodicity in this case means, well, you're finding out u plus s and v plus t being the same as the first one. So in this case, what the period means is not, of course, not unique. Also, the s up there, you won't get the shortest period. You'll just get some s for which this holds. But as we've seen, that's good enough. And also here, if you get some s so that t is not zero, you can actually compute the discrete log of h base g s minus s over t, model the order of g.